Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. Hey, Health Junkies. On this episode of the Health Fix Podcast, I'm interviewing Kim Vopney. She is the founder of Pelvian Wellness, a company offering pelvic health programs and coaching for women in pregnancy, motherhood, and menopause. Now, in online circles and women's health groups, Kim is known as the vagina coach, and she is a spitfire full of information. Kim is a certified fitness professional, a published author, and a women's health educator. She's the creator of the Buff Muff Method and Membership. She's the author of Your Pelvic Floor and one of the hosts of the Pelvic Love Retreat. Today, Kim and I are going to be talking about pelvic health as not only something to do and and get pelvic health PT per se uh, as a means to fix a problem, but as a lifestyle, keeping your pelvic floor healthy for life. And Kim wants everyone to know that it is never too late to start working on your pelvic health. I learn a ton in this podcast from how to prevent tearing during childbirth to lowering the chances or reoccurrence of pelvic surgery. Ladies, this is one podcast you do not want to miss and you will want to share with your friends and family. So let's introduce you to Kim Vopney. Kim, welcome to the Health Fix Podcast. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Oh my gosh, it's been a long time coming since we have a mutual friend, Dr. Brian Grogan, and I've watched you guys work together on different things. And I was like, I need to talk to this gal. I need to have her on. <laughs> And really what, what sparked some of this was I started to have some issues with incontinence while I'm doing my workouts, different jumps, different squats, different things started causing trouble. And I was like, okay, I need to reach out. And then I saw that you had an app and all these beautiful things. So tell us a little bit, just so my folks can kind of get a little background on you. What, what brought you to specialize in pelvic and vaginal health? Mm-hmm. I know it's not something you you think of growing up aspiring to be, right? I remember wanting to be a dolphin trainer. That was a, a, mm -hmm. a life goal I had. But so long story was long story made short. I saw a childbirth video in sex ed class and I said, I don't want anything to do with that, but it did spark a bit of a curiosity. And I started to ask my mom questions and look at the women in my life a little bit differently and thought, well, they all, all done it and they're carrying on. So I sort of grew up with this fear fascination of birth and I really was pretty adamant that I wasn't going to have children. Then when I did decide I wanted to start a family, I was determined to have a different story than my mom, who I did witness having surgery for incontinence, having chronic back pain, having a tummy that wouldn't flatten, avoiding certain exercise and activities, having a hysterectomy. Like I was witnessing all of this and, and I was really determined to have a different story. So I thought, okay, well, I'll just have a cesarean section and that will solve all my problems and my pelvic floor will be fine. And through that process of learning more about that, I realized it's not the magic, just take, do a cesarean and everything's going to be fine. You, or you could arguably have some increased risk for some things. So my midwives had recommended a product to me called the, the Epino. Epino stands for no episiotomy and it's a product made in Germany. A physician from Germany was in Africa and witnessed women using gourds of increasing size to prepare their perineum and pelvic floor for birth. And he thought, well, that's a great idea, but that's not going to fly in North America. So let's see if we can make something a bit more mainstream. So he worked with doctors, midwives, physiotherapists, and designed a medical device. And my midwife told me about this. I purchased one, used it, had a great experience. And I thought, why doesn't everybody have one of these? So I contacted the company and said, could I be a distributor here in Canada? And I didn't intend for it to be a business. I thought I'll just sell a few on the side. And I did at the start. It was just a sort of a little side gig. And then uh, I was laid off in 2009 from my corporate job. I was working in human resources and I had previous, my previous life, I had been in fitness. I, I was a personal trainer. And as I started now promoting this product and trying to make it more of a business, all the principles I was talking about were fitness focused stretch and strength and preparation for a physical event and how, how are we going to recover more optimally? And so I started an e-commerce store, added pelvic health products. Then I started to see, well, okay, now I'm, I'm wanting women to know this information ahead of a, a, an event that is very common in female bodies that is a major contributor to pelvic floor dysfunction. 
So I created a program called Prepare to Push, and it was meant to help educate women about the pelvic floor prior to birth, how they could prepare for birth, how they could use movement, how they could recover. And ultimately, of course, I was wanting them to buy an EpiNo as well. Then I recognized the postpartum recovery period was so overlooked. So I ended up forming a second business with two other women called Belly Zinc. And we wanted to take inspiration from other cultures around the world who use belly wrapping and really honor that postpartum recovery phase of life that we here, as soon as you're pregnant, you, you or sorry, as soon as you've given birth, you, you can't look pregnant. You have to erase all signs. It becomes a place of shame, this belly that you have, and you're back at the gym two weeks postpartum and everybody's giving you high fives. So we wanted to change that and bring, you know, old traditional practices into the more modern day realm and, and incorporate pelvic floor exercise and recovery. So we did that and was juggling the two for a while. Uh, created a certification course for other fitness and health professionals within our scope of not being internal therapists. How could we help spread the word? And and so it, that's been a 19-year journey now, all the, this little side thing that I started. <laughs> it, it, it's morphed and evolved in a, in a lot of ways, but ultimately I'm very passionate about increasing awareness and education around pelvic health and incorporating fitness and movement and lifestyle principles to to the pelvic floor, rather than thinking of it just being just your Kegels and everything's going to be solved. Right. It's a much bigger conversation than that. And so that's, that's how it all happened. I am fascinated by this, this epino thing. Like, mm -hmm. are you still selling these? I, I didn't see that. I wasn't diving very deep in that department on your website. Are you, are you still selling those? No. So what happened <laughs> with that is I was the Canadian importer distributor for 14 years. And then yeah. Health Canada, which is like the FDA, they implemented a new medical device regulation procedure uh, or process plan, whatever you want to call it, that had a lot more hoops to jump through. Had a, It was a lot more costly for companies. And the manufacturer in Germany, Texana is the name of the manufacturer, they sort of said, you know what, we're not, we're not prepared to jump through all these hoops. We've been here for 14 years. We know the product's you know, we've gone through all of these safety standards already. This is just a make money scenario for the government. And they chose to leave Canada. And I fought so hard. I fought, but I was written up in the Globe and Mail, which is a major newspaper about <laughs> this. Cause there was, it wasn't just them. It was hundreds of smaller companies were choosing to leave Canada because of it because of the additional layers and additional costs. And, and it was so sad because so many incredible products now weren't available for people anymore. So that was at the end of 2018. And so with that, I closed down my e-commerce store um, because it was the main part of my e-commerce and I wasn't prepared to keep the process, keep all of that other stuff with, I didn't have that main one. And then Belly Zinc, which we did have a physical product that we manufactured as well. Uh, I ended up selling that, the product side of that business as well. And that's, that was sort of the, thankfully transition to being totally online before the pandemic hit. And uh, yeah, so belly zinc still exists. The epino still exists. It's just not available in North America, unfortunately. Ah, oh, so yeah. ladies, if you're planning on getting pregnant and, <laughs> and wanting to work on things, go to, go to Europe and um, grab one. Cause I mean, I don't, I don't think I've ever heard of, I, I'm thinking through like my training, right. And thinking through of the nurse midwives, I know I have not heard of mm -hmm. anything to mm -hmm. prep the tissue and prep the pelvic floor for childbirth. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I know when you, when you learn about the product and the philosophy behind it, it's, it makes so much sense. And then, you know, again, from a fitness and movement perspective, that's what, that's how we train. That's how we prepare for physical events, sprints, mountain climbs, races, whatever we're doing, we use the principle of specificity. We have a training protocol we follow. We have a built-in recovery practice. And this this product, the EpiNo, incorporates all of that same philosophy and using biofeedback. So it helps women see and feel and connect with a part of the body that we can't physically, like we can't see our pelvic floor muscles. They are inside. So we see our external, external genitalia, but we don't we're and many people are often very disconnected from that part mm -hmm. of the body. So using biofeedback, which the EpiNo is not the only biofeedback device, it was the only one really for birth prep. But many physiotherapists will use probes and other types of biofeedback to help women connect with that group of muscles. But if we if we 
understand the greatly increased risks of pregnancy and childbirth to the pelvic floor and to optimal function, why we are not doing more ahead of time to educate and step in with, you know, some people view it as an intervention, but I'm all for an intervention that's going to help prepare the body and the person for this upcoming event and also impart the importance of this group of muscles that nobody really seems to pay attention to until there actually is a problem. You're so on point on that. I mean, even as a doc, right, I I didn't specialize in this department. I actually don't have children to this day thinking probably I was watching that same video you were watching and <laughs> you took it upon yourself to do something about it. I just went, nope, mm -mm, disconnect, not going to do that. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. But but what you're describing to me, you know, let's put it this way. I've run a lot. I've, I've been in a lot of mountain bike races and, and marathons. I wouldn't just do it out of nowhere. Exactly. And, most women, childbirth is longer than I've spent running a marathon, even my slowest ones. And like, it, it's like a light bulb in my head right now going like, oh my goodness, you know. Well, and you you hear, so often you hear kind of anecdotally, oh, birth is like running a marathon. No, it's like four, five, six, even more marathons. And what happens, as you say, you prepare for that marathon. You don't just decide to run a marathon and go and run for four hours. You you have a training protocol and you have nourishment and you have recovery. And, you know, there's so many elements built in. And then pregnancy and childbirth are just like, well, they've been doing it for centuries. So uh, I guess I'll be fine. And we just sort of we have this go with the flow mentality that really just isn't serving us. It isn't. It isn't. And it makes sense to to prep for this. So, OK, ladies who are listening, I know you that a lot of people who listen to my podcast are older, but hey, let's face it. A lot of us tend to get pregnant a lot later in life now. And at that point, I'm thinking, gosh, you know, we could benefit from this. You can tell your kids, grandkids, tell everybody, tell everybody. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and you can take the same philosophy of preparing and being proactive and applying it. So regardless of whether you've had children or not, that's yeah. irrelevant. The pelvic floor is still the pelvic floor and still faces lots of other uh, influences that can then can impact function and performance. But if we think take that same mentality and say, if I'm lucky enough to reach midlife, I am going to go through menopause and there are significant changes that happen in midlife and beyond. So how can I prepare for that phase of life? And how can I keep, how can I keep training the pelvic floor to handle all phases that I go through? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so thinking about training the pelvic floor, one of the things that I, I saw, which which is again post-birth, but you had an article that talked about France, women, French women don't pee their pants mm -hmm. and how it's built in to the French like medical post postpartum care. And so yeah. I think that what I'm trying to do is just paint the picture for women who may be like, mm, I don't know if I want to do pelvic floor, how important it is, but also we'll get there in terms of telling them like how, how you can train your pelvic mm -hmm. floor. So mm -hmm. yeah, that, the French article, how did you come upon that? Like, what the heck? I've actually known, I, I hadn't, I haven't really shared it that way but I, it's something that I've been aware of for years and years, especially when I first was starting out in this field. I worked primarily with pregnant women and new moms. Now I work primarily with pre, um, like perimenopause and postmenopause women. Um, but when I was working pr predominantly in the birth world, we all knew that, and we and and still we we have all said, why is this not a global standard? Why is this not happening everywhere? And the the um, addition to what I shared. So it is automatic, an automatic prescription for somebody who has given birth. So if you've given birth, you are automatically given this prescription for pelvic floor therapy postpartum. That doesn't mean that if you, you, you have to have given birth in order to access that care. So if you were experiencing incontinence or organ prolapse, or had other concerns with your pelvic health, you can still in France, ask your doctor for a prescription for pelvic floor physical therapy that is also in as part of their funding, their, their government funded care. And just today, actually, my previous business partner who is a pelvic floor physical therapist, she sent me, uh, she was originally practicing in, in um, Ontario, Canada. She's now moved down to Texas, but she sent me, she's still part of the Ontario Physiotherapy Association. And she sent me an article to read. I have not gone through the whole thing, but it was it, basically the Ontario is is putting forward a motion to 
do what they're doing in France. So that was like, hallelujah, you know, and, and so hopefully that will kind of spur yeah. things on because when you think about the costs associated with managing and caring for people with pelvic floor dysfunction, it is in the government's best interest to apply some of their funding to that in order to prevent and to help better manage these. And I, I so that in and of itself is a huge argument from a financial perspective. And then when you think of quality of life of these people, how many people suffer for years and years and years and how their increased risks of bone loss and heart disease and diabetes increase because of the limitations of their pelvic floor. Again, it's in the best interest of our healthcare systems to, to dedicate some funds to prevention and restorative therapy with pelvic floor physical therapists. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. I mean, right now in, in Tacoma, Washington, where I practice, we have six pelvic floor physical therapists and they're slammed. And yeah. so, you know, all of you guys online are, are my, my resources to be like, okay, here's what we're doing. And, you know, I think also there's a huge component with the population being of menopausal age and <laughs> having practiced in the same place for over a decade now, I've seen women go through the, this period and I'm kind of kicking myself, right? Because I didn't know enough. It, it, it wasn't really brought up to me in school about it. I, mm -hmm. I only had the luxury of having a pelvic floor physical therapist in my spa that I, I owned. And now she's in my office now because it's, it's like, oh my gosh. How once you know, I, once you know, right? you can't go back. Like you can't yeah. unsee that you, you can't, yeah. you can't. And so with the, with the, the side of prolapse, with the side of interstitial cystitis, I mean, I'm seeing all of these different things. And, and so I'm very curious on, on your end with the programs you have, what have you seen to be like the most, like move the needle the most in terms of a, a program, like exercise program and serration to help either rejuvenate or bring things back or obviously maintenance too, just to give folks a sense of like, all right, we've been having this trouble for a little bit. What are we getting into to, to reboot this? Cause of course I want you guys to do this, but give folks yeah. the background in terms of what it's looking like on a daily basis, a maintenance basis, a mm -hmm. everything. Yeah. Just to, to highlight one thing that you said there with, you know, you didn't know. And so, as I said, if we take the, the lens, if we look at it through the lens of, well, there's been a huge amount of education now about prenatal postpartum. And still, even I've been doing, that was, you know, where I started 19 years ago and even actually almost 20 years ago now, when I think about it, but the, I, I look at now and say, well, everybody must know that we should prepare the pelvic floor for birth, but still, it is still definitely underserved. However, there is a lot more awareness created about it. So th what is happening now with menopause is the world, the conversation has exploded. Celebrities are talking, everybody's talking about menopause and a component of menopause and the symptoms like, you know, they list off all the millions of symptoms that we experience in perimenopause and postmenopause. is there's a whole section called genitourinary syndrome of menopause. And that is all pelvic health, vaginal health related. So indirectly the conversation around pelvic health has been increasing because of this conversation around menopause. But to your point, and I am going to answer your question with regards to programs, but to your point about, we, well, I didn't know, but we should be teaching this in schools. When we teach kids, when I saw that childbirth education video, yeah, I started learning about menstrual health and about body health. And really it was about contraception and the period. But even then it was just like, you're going to have a period. And then this is what you use. It didn't really tell us about the hormones or the, the cycle and what it all means and and that it's part of this, you know, our, our anatomy, this other group of muscles very close to the uterus that we're just talking about deserves a lot of attention because we menstruate, because the majority of us are pregnant, because if we reach midlife, we will go through menopause and we have all these influences that can create challenges. So really this should be taught to our teens and, so. and, and plant the seed pelvic floor physical therapy. So what moves the needle the most? I mean, always my number one recommendation is if you take one thing away from this conversation, it would be to see a pelvic floor physical therapist once a year, just like you see a dentist for your teeth for a checkup that, and so 
just by going to that appointment is not necessarily like, I don't want to say that's going to move your needle. You have to take action with what you learn and what they assess and tell you about your pelvic floor. So in terms of programs, most people think of pelvic floor exercise, if they, if they even use that terminology, or if they think about, I need something to fix my incontinence, they think of Kegels. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Arnold Kegel, 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 tomato, tomato. He saw his patients, excuse me, postpartum who were experiencing more challenges, activating and relaxing your pelvic floor and experiencing some symptoms. So he used this device called a perineometer, which was a biofeedback device, had some similar properties to this epino I was talking about that helped women see when they were contracting and relaxing this group of muscles that again, we can't, we can't go to the mirror and flex (laughs) our pubic oxygeous muscles, right? So (laughs) this biofeedback device was helping them learn to contract and relax their muscles. And then he would send them home with that new knowledge and awareness and now go do sets and reps of this contract and relax. So that became a Kegel exercise. What has happened with the Kegel is the, the Kegel hasn't necessarily it's evolved in some people's practices, but most people just hear the word Kegel and they think that's the only thing we have, we've got. And because people are not never taught or evaluated, you know, we, we, a pap once a year, or even once every couple of years is not a real true pelvic floor evaluation. And so we've never really been taught how to do a Kegel. And so we have pamphlets that have been given to us. We might've Googled it if, you know, if, if it's been in the last 20 years or, and so that's what we do go on. And we have research to show that the majority of people actually do them incorrectly because we have never been taught properly. So then they go, Oh, I tried Kegels and they don't work, but Kegels when done correctly, when done consistently are, we have loads of evidence to support that they work very well. We're, I always thought the the research and the application that way fell a little bit short was if I said to somebody, do three sets of 10, 10 second hold Kegels three times a day, which is what some of the evidence will tell you to do, that will help. But most people would do them seated or lying down. Some people do them at every red light or while they're brushing their teeth. And if it's done correctly and consistently, that's better than nothing. However, that person may still experience leaks when they do jumps, box jumps or run or cough or sneeze, because there's an element of reaction time that we're missing out on training. And there's an element of dynamic movement and and loading that we're missing out on. And so my, my approach has always been, let's take this evidence based exercise, the Kegel, and let's bring it I call it the core breast because I wanted people to understand that the pelvic floor works in coordination with the diaphragm and that it is the foundation of the core. We've all heard of core exercise, but the pelvic floor has been left out of that conversation. So let's take this core breath and coordinate that into whole body movement. And so that's always been my approach. And thankfully now there's research that supports my bias. And there was two separate studies that I referenced. One was showing Kegels done prior to a resistance training program. And another one was Kegels done as part of a resistance training program. One was in an elderly population even, and it was showing quicker results and more effective than Kegels alone. So to answer your question, that was a very long winded way back to what has moved the needle the most when people understand the connection of the breath and the di- um, the breath and the pelvic floor and coordinate that into whole body movement and progressively load it. It, 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 ch- I would say that changes the needle the most on incontinence. And I would say hypopressives, which is a whole other exercise technique moves the needle the most on prolapse and the two together, I call the power couple of pelvic floor fitness. Wow. Cool stuff. Cool stuff. I mean, there, I, I'm looking at it, right? I'm 46 as as of the time of this podcast right now. You know what I'm thinking to myself? Okay, I was doing some of the exercises that I've seen with Dr. Bree and I added them in and I'm like, okay, cool. I didn't have any symptoms. This is where I went wrong. I was like, yeah, they're fine. You know, I've been adding it in here and there, but then I don't be, then I'm not consistent. And I think that's where a lot of people will get hung up. Like, mm, I don't really have that many symptoms or they'll be like, I do have symptoms, 
but I don't know if it's gone that far. And that's where one of my patients were, was at, especially with the prolapse kind of situation. And yeah. so having those two dynamic ones that you're talking about, the di- what did you call it? I was calling it dynamic duo in my head. That's what, came, that's what I, popped I said power, power couple. Power, yeah. Power yeah. couple. <laughs> and yeah. is now these two, are they part of one of your programs? Are they part of Buff Muff? Are they part of? Yeah. Yum. So the, I originally in 20, I think it was 2017, I created an online program called, I called it Kegel Mojo. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, lots of people, not, not everybody, this is before the pandemic, pandemic, everybody was putting something online, but yes. this was before. So there was enough, but there wasn't really an online program. Uh, Brie had created one, I think. And um, at that time, anyway, so I created this program and it was self-directed and you know, I, I was thinking, of course, it's going to change the world and everybody's going to use it and it's going to be great. And and it was great, but it was just it, people needed more direction in terms of how to apply the information to the movement. So I did provide some exercise and some routines, but they wanted a bit more structure and handholding. So I created a, a 28 day challenge. There was a company out of Montreal who had created uh, they had an app platform that was allowing f- they, their target market was fitness coaches and they wanted people who were coaches who were running challenges to use their platform. So I was one of their first customers and I had always wanted an app, but an app like there, it's super expensive to have your own custom app. So they had already this, this platform and you just needed to kind of plug and play your information. So I create this 28 day challenge and it took off like, like people mm-hmm. loved this. And then I would just, you know, every, I'd run it every month. And then I'd say, okay, it's time to buff your muff. And I, it just kind of came out as a joke. And and then everyone was like, oh, yeah, buff your muff. I love it. And so then I thought, all right, I'm just going to call it the buff muff challenge. So originally it was just this 28-day buff muff challenge. And then I I wanted to, um, like, again, people would come in and then they would want this, this next step. Like, now what do I do? And so it needed to be, I needed to keep people progressing. And so it's kind of, it's this method and and I do have a membership around it. And people can use the app if they want, or they can use, they can log in online. Not everybody likes to use their phone. So you have options in terms of how you, you log in, but it's a, it's very much a lifestyle uh, education. It's not just here's do these exercises and everything's going to be fine. And some people will come in initially and they go, when am I going to get to the exercise? Cause there's about an hour of content broken into little videos, but there's about an hour of stuff that people have to go through first and I, I, some people, you know, you, you could skip ahead if you want to, but you have to know the fundamentals. You, you can't just skip ahead and just like, oh, I'll just do this exercise and everything's going to be fine. You have to understand why the exercise works and what's contributing to your symptoms. So I lay the foundation. And one of the other things that a lot of people, one of the most common comments I get actually is people saying, I'm sleeping through the night again without having to wake up multiple times a night to pee, which tell me about life changing when you sleep better, your pelvic health is indirectly going to be better as well. But so is all the other parts. Everything is better when you sleep well. Oh my gosh. I mean, sleep is such a thing, right? And, and being in my side of things, I'm kind of on the bioidentical hormones. I'm trying to optimize cortisol, things of that nature. I never thought about the pelvic floor for sleep. So now. Yep. yep. It and, blew and my the- mind. Yeah. And the hormone piece is that will move the needle for some people as well, too. It's, it's all, it's there. It's kind of like Kegels are not the answer for everybody. There's, there are multi, there's, it's a multifaceted part of the body. There's multiple influences that can come in and, and might be a contributor to symptoms for some people. And um, so bioidentical hormones, vaginal estrogen is something I talk a lot about. I've written a, a lengthy article about that with the evidence as well. Um, as, as part of, so using vaginal estrogen is not going to magically solve your pro- prolapse or your incontinence, but it's going to help. And then you've got the exercise piece and then you have the let's avoid constipation piece. Let's stay hydrated piece. Like we don't realize all the things we do, like stop drinking as much water because I don't want to leak or I don't want to have the urges yeah. that I don't know. And we end up becoming dehydrated, which then the bladder signals you more frequently to get it out because it's irritating when you have concentrated urine. So we think we're helping, but we're ending up creating other issues. Constipation is a major contributor to incontinence and urgency and frequency. 
So when people get their bowels moving, yes, that helps the pelvic floor because you're not going to strain. Yes, it helps your incontinence. Yes, it's going to help with all of the other things in life because we don't want to be cranky pated all day long, right? So it's it's not just do your Kegels and it's not just a couple of exercises. It it really is a whole whole body approach. A whole system. That's huge. It's huge. And I mean, just thinking about the hormone situation, because I think a lot of people do think if I just use the hormones, mm-hmm. it's going to solve mm-hmm. the problem. And And yes, I've been in that category of trying to explain that's not the whole situation. You know, with the pelvic floor, I'm like thinking about, you know, a lot of women, and I don't know how much you've seen this, but I'm guessing you have because it's what you do. Um, Women that have had the meshes, that -hmm. have had the different lifts, the slings, things of that nature. What kind of impact does that have on the pelvic floor in that case? If you think of any surgery, a surgical intervention, so the the mesh surgeries or bladder sling surgeries, for a while there was mesh use for prolapse, which it the the mesh that created the whole scandal around pelvic challenges is no longer used. There is still mesh that is used in the pelvic floor. It's just not that same mesh, to be clear. However, the surgical intervention is can be life-changing, can be an absolutely fantastic option. It is never what I would recommend as a first line of defense. And unfortunately, many people are sent down that path without looking at all of the other root causes, basically, for their problem. And for some people, they they have the surgery and it and it fixes the problem. Great. For some people, it fixes it for a period of time and then they're frustrated. For some people, it fixes that first problem, but now it's created another problem. And it can become this vicious cycle. And people will often come to me and say, well, I've had the mesh surgery or I've had a prolapse repair. Will this still help me? Mm -hmm. And I argue it's even more essential after surgery. So now coming back full circle to where we started, prevention. If, If surgery is something we are choosing or is something we need, we need to prepare for that surgery. We need to train our pelvic floor. We need to prepare our body to undergo that controlled trauma. And we need to prepare for the recovery afterwards. So we are supporting the healing process. Then we need like postpartum, we need to retrain that system, the pelvic floor is part of the core working with the breath and then progressively load it. And so many people are suffering for many years, finally get so bad, they go to the doctor I don't want to lump every doctor, but this is very, very common. I hear it every day. My doctor said I need surgery. They get referred to a specialist. They're booked for surgery. Their symptoms are gone initially. And they're like, okay, great. But the the root causes that contributed to that problem developing in the first place are many and have not all been addressed. And oftentimes it's things like constipation, low estrogen, poor lifting technique, repetitive, you know, like all of these things. And if they go back now with a group of muscles that has undergone this controlled trauma that now has scar tissue that can hinder function, then they're just going to see a repeat. And that's why there is a quite a high recurrence rate of issues post pelvic surgery, because we haven't looked at all of those things that maybe could have even prevented that surgery from happening in the first place, if people knew. And I'm going to lump hysterectomies in there as well, because hysterectomy is one of the most common surgeries performed 600,000 in the United States alone every single year, often for benign conditions. And one of those conditions is pelvic organ prolapse. And if you have a hysterectomy for any reason, it increases your risk of other types of prolapse, especially the posterior compartment, which is something called a rectocele. And if the reason you had the hysterectomy was because of prolapse, that risk is even greater. And nobody is told that. And again, when we think about, we need to be proactive and train the body and recover and progressively load and retrain that system. That is absolutely not happening with hysterectomy. So women are initially like, great, it's, you know, whatever symptoms they had are gone. And then several years later, now they have other issues that are now further complicated by the fact that there has been a surgery already. I see that too. I see that too. Yeah. Over and over again. 
especially rectus seals are interesting and, and fecal incontinence and things of that nature. Some of the things that women will like, I have to drag it out of people yeah. Yeah. to know. It's hard that to is, talk about. Yeah. I mean, embarrassing. I get it. I get it. Let's, let's talk a little bit about that too, just in terms of the rectum, in terms of how that plays in to the pelvic mm-hmm. floor. Cause I think a lot of people think pelvic floor and they don't attach. We're thinking vaginal area. We're thinking female parts. We're not thinking about the rectum for some yeah, reason. We think about, we think about leaking pee. That's kind of yep. what we think about with pelvic floor right. issues. And statistically, if you look statistically, it's like 40 ish percent are the st- st- statistics for urinary incontinence. Um, I argue it's a lot more because there's a lot of people who just think that it's normal and they have to put up with it and they don't talk about it with their doctors. So I, I think that number is much higher. Then we look at prolapse. Statistically, 50% of women who've given birth will have some degree of prolapse in their life and never screened for, never talked about. And so early stage prolapse is often asymptomatic. And so it's not until it becomes a major problem. And it's probably been developing years and years, you know, at, 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 over a number of years. And people are really sidelined, but that's that's a bigger percentage of the population. And often they'll have incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse. And nobody's heard the term prolapse before. It's starting to become talked about it a little bit more now, but nobody's really told it. And if you look sometimes even in the literature, prolapse is more historically, I would say this is, but if it, it's always just the womb prolapse or the uterus prolapse. It, the, the bladder and the rectum were never mm. considered as something that could prolapse. It was always just the uterus. But rectoceles are really quite common. And so in pelvic organ prolapse, what's happening is the bladder, the uterus, and or the rectum, sometimes even the intestines, will shift out of their optimal anatomical position and start to bulge into or descend into the vagina. And early stage can be asymptomatic as it becomes a bit more advanced. Some of the more common symptoms would be low back pain, sense of heaviness or dragging, feeling like something's inside your vagina, difficulty with insertion, difficulty starting the flow of urine or feeling like you don't empty, urinary tract infections, difficulty emptying the bowel, always feeling there's something like stuck there, um, bulges. So if as it becomes more advanced, you may see or feel a bulge at the opening of the vagina. In extreme cases, it bulges out um, outside. It almost looks like a scrotum to some extent. And it's very, very life altering. And the rectocele in particular, I have, I've experienced, I've experienced all of them. I've had a stage two uterine prolapse. I've had a stage two rectocele. Right now I have a very early stage bladder prolapse. It's been there for a long time and it's just kind of hanging out. Didn't mean it to say like, hang out. It's not hanging <laughs> out, but just <laughs> there. Um, but the, so the uterine prolapse was what presented itself first during my perimenopause transition. I was, I didn't know the term perimenopause. I had no idea what was happening with me. Um, constipation was all of a sudden something I was dealing with. I'd never had before in my life, never changed anything. Uh, ended up having an auto, uh, underlying autoimmune condition as well, Hashimoto's. But so once I figured all that out, it was, I'd been straining quite a bit and my uterus was, uh, just one day I was having sex with my husband and all of a sudden it was like, it felt like he hit something and it was sort of jarring and, I went to my physio who I'd seen about six months earlier and she's like, yeah, your uterus is moving south. And so um, with hypopressives and and I was already doing buff muff, but it was right around that time. Thankfully, I had learned hypopressives and started applying that. And I, I was able within a few months to reverse that. I'd also had a, an early stage rectocele that continued, like it didn't progress terribly, but it, it just over time would continue to progress a little bit. And it's, it became symptomatic and I did all the things I threw everything, the kitchen sink at it. And after nine years, I just said, I, I, there's nothing more that I can do here. And I'm tired. I'm these symptoms are interfering with the quality of my life. And I chose to have surgery for that. Um, at the time I did, again, I have an early stage bladder prolapse, but I chose just to leave that as it is. And, uh, so I had a posterior rectocele, well, posterior vaginal wall or rectocele repair at three and a half years ago um, December, 2020. And that opened up that, like, I felt like the biggest hypocrite here. I am telling everybody how to avoid surgery and, and do all these exercises, but it was also a, it's, it's a, it's a moment where you realize exercise 
won't fix everything. Hormones won't fix everything. Avoiding constipation won't fix everything. Sometimes there is damage to the tissues for whatever reason. I then found out just before I had my surgery. So that was 14 years after my second birth that um, I went to a new physio and she suspected I had something called a levator avulsion, which is a, where oh. a part of the pelvic floor is not attached to the bone anymore. And this actually happens in about 30% of vaginal births. Again, not screened for, nobody knows. And so I still went ahead with the surgery and it was just about mm, eight months ago. I can't remember exactly when, but eight months ago where I actually fit, like had it confirmed with a 3D ultrasound with a with a physician um, that I have that. So that increases my risk for prolapse and and all the incontinence and all the things. But one comment he made was, it's really good that you have been so consistent with your pelvic floor exercise because your the muscles that are intact are, are all very they're they're doing the job very very well to, even though they have to compensate for that um challenge so anyway lots of things were kind of working against me and there was there was no there, 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 all the exercise in the world all the hormones in the world were not going to fix my rectocele so i chose surgery at that point but i prepared for it i trained for it i did all all the things to get myself yeah. in the best state possible I had a full recovery protocol. I did progressive loading. It wasn't until six months post-op where I was back to loading like I was before. Um, and I, I, it became a new program, actually, oddly enough, because I said, like, there's no support for people going through pelvic surgery. And, um, and I really want to highlight that surgery can fix symptoms, but it does not fix root causes and it does not just magically optimize your function. It can help improve anatomy, which can help improve function, but you still need to do the work to get the muscles working well again. I'm speechless. I'm like, holy cow. <laughs> I never knew that you could tear the levator. Mm -hmm. This is levator ani, I'm guessing. Yes. The levator like ani, yeah, which is which is a group of muscles and it's one part of the pelvic floor. And it is, um, yeah, a, a, an avulsion injury. It, the terminology is pulled off the bone, right? Yes, and you can have a partial, or you can have a full. You could have one side. You could have bilateral. And so mine is one side on the left. And he said there was one little section on the right that, but he said I wouldn't even really, you know, it wasn't a major issue. It's more of on the left-hand side. So two, two muscles, two of my levator muscles are not attached. I have no, I had no idea this kind of thing could happen. And, and now that I'm thinking, I'm like, okay, how can we help some folks to maybe clue in that this could be a thing mm -hmm. and, and like, see if they could get someone to do a pelvic ultrasound to find it. Like, is it a transvaginal ultrasound that finds these kind of things? Or, I mean, I'm imagining you need somebody that's knows that this can happen because yeah so right now and again i i live in canada right and the person i went to go see is in the united states and the reason i went to him was he was actually i had invited him on my podcast oh, cool. to talk about levator avulsion um i've had a a, a guest on my podcast who is a, a a an advocate she has had suffered tremendously with bilateral avulsion and uh and has been a, an incredible advocate for this population of people and so I'd had her story and, um, and then after my physio, just before my surgery had said, you know, I think you have one. And it had always just kind of been sitting there in my mind. So I brought this doctor on cause he is one of the only people who have, have surgical techniques to repair. So historically up until now, it's really been like, well, there's nothing we can do. There's no surgical repair for an avulsion injury. And he is, using new techniques to change that mentality and, and has really helped bring people's quality of life back as much as possible. So I had him on the podcast and then, you know, he's in Washington, DC. He said, well, if you're ever here, you know, we'll let's check it out and see, we'll confirm it. So, uh, I made the decision to go and say, all right, I, if I stay in Canada, it will probably take me maybe a year, year and a half to get the requisition to get the imaging to, <laughs> so I'm just going to go and I'll pay the money and, and so anyway, so I did a, and it was a 3d, it was, uh, uh, like almost like a, like a pelvic ultrasound. So a wand that's inserted and he rotates around and, and I was watching, I filmed it. I will be sharing some of the images, um, of the time I, I wanted to film the whole thing. And 
it's long, so I did I won't share the whole thing, but just little snippets of things that he has said and images where you can see the deficits compared to the healthy attached muscle. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. I no no idea. No idea. Yeah. And and it and it's you know, if you look at the research, 30%. And they say that like um uh, what's the word like minimal avulsion, there can be some recovery over a period of time, but especially the really significant injuries, there's, there's currently nothing. So there's no screening in place for that. There's no, there's nothing that says, well, if we could intervene with these protocols, maybe it would help a little bit. So many people are walking around with avulsion that have no idea. And so if, if you have tried all the things for six to 12 months, seen pelvic floor physical therapy, you've done the exercise consistently, your technique is good, you've tried hyperpressives, you like all the things and nothing is moving the needle, then it's worth at, like, and not a lot of manual pelvic floor therapists, they, you need, you really need imagery, you need imaging to confirm it. And physios, they, some of them may use like a transperineal ultrasound, mm -hmm. but you, you need more than that, like MRI even. And so many physios, if they're even feeling and assessing for it, they couldn't diagnose it. They could say, I suspect it, but the people would then themselves have to go and ask for imaging to confirm that. And that can be a long process. Huh. Oh my goodness. So in my mind, of course, I'm going, okay, childbirth, one way to have an avulsion. Is there any other way, like say someone had a really bad skiing accident, yard sale, one leg's going this way, the other one's going that way. Like I'm thinking spread injuries or I'm thinking like something in the case of skiing and, and I'm going to explain myself for a mm -hmm. moment because you got my mind going a little bit about, mm -hmm. does this make sense? Mm -hmm. I don't do well with deadlifts mm -hmm. and I always feel like a tearing pain, mm -hmm. very deep. Mm -hmm. very on the ins, like where the levator and I would attach to my right side of my pelvis, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, okay, because I've had overstretch injuries where I literally almost did the splits mm -hmm. with one mm -hmm. ski going one because it got stuck and the other one keeping going. Does yeah. that kind of situation preclude? You know what? Things? I have thought of something like that too. And I've never looked and I'm, I'm going to do it now. I'm going to look in the research. <laughs> I don't know of all the research I've done looking at pelvic floor or even just avulsion, I've never seen any reference to anything other than childbirth, mm -hmm. but I could imagine yeah. a car accident with certain, you know, very sudden tearing motions of, of like limbs going different ways and ski, if, ski for sure. I bet you, I just don't know if there's anything published on that, but I'll look and I'll get back to you. I look forward to seeing that. I'm kind of, I mean, I'm just, I've been trying for like most of my life to figure out why I have this weird tearing pain. In have my you seen brain. a pelvic floor physical therapist? I have, and nobody has noticed anything. And granted, it's been a couple of years because mm -hmm. this this started like over a decade ago after a mm -hmm. ski injury. Mm -hmm. and, and at the time when I first had someone look at it, I'm wondering if maybe, maybe my tissue wasn't inflamed. I don't know. I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah, and it would be, and I would, um, many therapists will assess in different positions as well, like mm -hmm. upright against gravity and trying, and, you know, so I, for you, I would think, I don't know what your, how, like how your injury happened. You're saying ski, skiing. So I'm imagining there was a, as you say, there was a spread. So yes. if you were, I'm just thinking if you were a patient and I was doing an internal evaluation, I would take the limb and try to move it through ranges of motion to try to replicate that stretch sensation that you feel in a movement, or you said a deadlift is where you feel it. So I would even assess like me as the therapist, I am not an internal therapist, but if I was, I would be on the floor. I would have my fingers inserted and I would have you do the motion of a deadlift to try to replicate that sensation. Even if it wasn't, if you're not under load, it might not happen as much, but, and see if we can see, is it, is it, does, does the muscle function differently? Is there something that's not moving accurately? Is there a pull? Is it right? So mm -hmm. maybe it's not an avulsion. Maybe it's simply there was some disruption, but there's maybe some scar tissue that's still residual there, but I'd want to try to see if we could find it through movement. Makes sense. Makes sense. Gosh, 
there's so many things with the pelvic floor that I could go down, you know, rabbit holes, like you're saying with the motion under low, different, different movements. But yeah, I, I will definitely look into that. Cause now that I'm learning these things, I'm like, <laughs> when that, I mean, the way that injury happened was insane. And so, and the pain was pretty bad. So I'm like, mm -hmm. and I, and I haven't been right since let's put it that mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's something to think about. And, and I just bring it up guys for the podcast just for you guys, if you've ever had something, you know, where it, you just haven't been right since. Yeah. And that's, that's important. Yeah. Um, the other big thing that I'd love to chat about before we wrap things up is talking about vaginal health because your podcast title between two lips, love it, love it. It's <laughs> good you. stuff. It's good stuff. There's so much that happens between the two lips that as we get older and as I am seeing more and more patients, I am, let's say, increasingly horrified <laughs> that we're not talking about this as mm -hmm. much to the point where I've had some patients where their two lips were sealed together yeah. because of that much inflammation. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about, you know, how you help folks in that department, what you've seen to be, you know, beneficial. What's, mm -hmm. what's your insider scoop in that department? What should we all be thinking about? Mm -hmm. We're preventative and maintenance. In that yeah. Time. The term that I referenced early, genitourinary syndrome of menopause, GSM, used to be called vaginal atrophy. And the, the terminology was not representative or didn't represent all of the different symptoms that somebody could be experiencing as it pertains to their vulval vaginal health. And so... The word syndrome is, in, indicates a collection of signs and symptoms, and we can have genital symptoms, we can have urinary symptoms, we can have sexual symptoms, and so different things will fall under each of those categories that are, um, estrogen gets the blame in terms of, it's, it's the low estrogen state, that's why this is happening, <clears throat> excuse me, and it absolutely plays a role, but there's so many different things. There's age-related muscle loss. <clears throat> there's collagen loss. There's hyaluronic acid loss. There's bone loss. And all of those can play a role in creating or manifesting these symptoms that we may have in the pelvic region, pelvic vaginal health. So statistically, I've seen between 50 and 80% of women will experience some, not necessarily always all, but often many of the symptoms of GSM. So 50% is high enough. If we're, mm. it's actually even upwards of 80, like that's a lot of people. Mm. And this is something that we also know does not improve. It's not one of the symptoms like, oh, your brain fog, it'll go away. Oh, your hot flashes, it'll eventually go away. This does not improve with time and will continue to worsen unless addressed. So knowing that information and knowing also that many of those symptoms, they, they're the first, I don't want to say always the first sensations, but where they become most bothersome is usually a few years into the post-menopause period. So once you've reached your one day of menopause and beyond your post-menopause, it's usually a couple, two to three years afterwards, where th things are starting to get bothersome. So knowing that maybe we could be preventive, maybe we could say, let's intervene. Be like, as I'm hitting my menopause, one of the things that I'm now going to do to support my pelvic and vulvovaginal vaginal health is to use vaginal estrogen. Vaginal moisturizers play a role. I argue things like collagen and creatine and vitamin D and C buckthorn oil all from a supplement perspective also play a role, but vaginal estrogen in particular for it will, it will help all of those symptoms but one of the main reasons is the reduction of UTIs. So the, the increased likelihood of UTI, urinary tract infection, skyrockets post-menopause, especially due to that low estrogen state that now changes the pH of the vagina. So we usually are quite acidic. That helps us fend off infection. Without estrogen, we, we now are, we lose that. The pH is, has changed, less acidic, more prone to infection, UTIs. People get treated multiple times for UTIs, and then it becomes resistant. And now no antibiotic is going to work and that can become life-threatening. So if it is only for reduction of the risk of UTIs, that is motivation enough for me. 
Um, but it also will help with painful sex, dryness, burning, irritation, urinary frequency, urinary um, incontinence, urgency. The, you mentioned the labia of your client. We, uh, everybody's got different sizes and shapes, but we have this plumpness and juiciness in our tissues that mm -hmm. the loss of estrogen and the loss of, you know, all the other things I was saying, hyaluronic acid and, and muscle loss, what have you, they, the, the, the term atrophy is essentially a shrinking or a drying or thinning of the tissues. And when left untreated, the opening of the vagina can close. The labia can retract. And, and as you say, they just sort of almost like, it's like they're fusing together in a sense. Mm -hmm. Same can happen around the clitoris. Like it, it, it can, it, it, it's drastic how it can alter the appearance and especially the function and the feel of, of our tissues. So it, it, again, I'm always kind of thinking of this, what can we do to prevent this? If we know this is a huge risk, I don't want to wait for symptoms. Right. What can I do now to help prepare? And there is loads and loads and loads of evidence about vaginal estrogen. And people always are very afraid of the word estrogen now because of the women's health initiative. And I, I shared a bunch of research in, a, in an article. Um, there's oodles and oodles and oodles and oodles of research now to show that if anything, it, it decreases our risk of many different types of cancers. Um, and there's no increased risk for mortality or recurrence in people who have had, in particular, breast cancer is a big one that people are concerned about when using vaginal estrogen. So I, I say and it's not a nutrient, but I jokingly say it's like an essential nutrient. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I absolutely agree with you. And I, ah, that Women's Health Initiative study. Ugh. Yeah, I know it created a, a big it's, it's maddening. It's maddening when you know the, when you know the history and the story and the, the misrepresentation of data and the way the media, it, it, it um, Dr. Kelly Casperson shared an incredible podcast episode called boomers should be pissed. And that says it like a huge, a whole pot, a whole generation missed out on incredibly beneficial therapies because of the misrepresentation of data from that study. Now, we, we've also learned a lot from that study, but sure. went that initial headline that was not accurate. And then all of the follow-up positive things have never been shared with the same vigor and, you know, publication. So there's a lot of people working very hard to make things viral on social media and the word is starting to get around, but there still is this, like, yeah. I think keep thinking, oh, people must know that now, but no. Every day I'm asked about breast cancer and estrogen. Me as well. Me as well. No, it's still, it's still there. The fear is real. And, oh, I mean, even on social, when I post on Instagram, there's always going to be haters in there being yeah. like, you're making people get cancer. Um, oh, I know. I know. Yeah. Like, we just have to share the research. Like, go eat your Cheetos and hang out in your mom's <laughs> bath basement. Seriously, <laughs> stop. Stop. You don't even know. Yeah. But yes, I mean, the research, the the proof right because now yeah. we're starting to have women who have done the bioidenticals like i have some women in my practice who are in their 80s and have been on bioidenticals since their 50s and i'm seeing how amazing they look yeah. Yeah. and vibrant and so yes. i hope that is the proof for folks to to turn this yeah. around that we can definitely use that but yeah. gosh, just knowing all this information, like Kim, you have blown my mind on so many things I had no idea about, no idea about. And I'm like, why? Like, same like you, why are we not teaching this in grade school? Why is our sex education class not about that versus scaring the pants off you about yeah. getting pregnant? Yeah. And also fitness education. Yeah. I, know we're, I know we're wrapping up, but just one yeah. final point. No, go for it. Fitness education. If I'm, if I am, if I'm responsible for moving people's bodies and improving muscle function, I should know about this other part of the body called the pelvic floor, which is a group of muscles with type two and type one muscle fibers and has a like all the other parts of the body. I learn about how to contract and which exercises are best. That should be fundamental in anybody who's taking fitness and movement, like becoming a personal trainer or a fitness instructor or movement therapist, whatever it, the pelvic floor needs to be in that base. It shouldn't have to be as it exists now, continuing education. That should be base level knowledge in those certifications. 
I, I'm in a hundred percent agreement with you because I've not, you know, in my different programs that I've been through with, with fitness, there hasn't been anything. And, you know, only because of, of you and Dr. Bree, did I even figure out in addition to the gal who's in my office that I should probably be thinking about this with my lifting because, yeah. you know, with power lifting, it's heavy weights. It's a lot of load yep. on the body. I love the daylights out of it, but it's, I, I'm certain I might've had like four children with the amount of load <laughs> that I've put yeah. on my, I don't know. Right. Yeah. I don't know. But these are the things that it's so important for folks to be taking away. And especially with fitness, because I think a lot of women I've talked to over the years have been like, I can't go to the gym. You know, I can't like, if they make me do burpees or jumping jacks, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a signal the body's sending you saying, I need some help here. doesn't mean that you can't ever do that exercise again. It just means that currently I need some help, but let's rebuild it. And people can lift heavier and can last longer and can perform exercise better when their pelvic floor is optimized. But so many people stop exercising or are told they can't do certain things or just self-select out of certain movements because of these symptoms. But we, we, it doesn't mean that that exercise is bad and there isn't a safe and unsafe list. It's just a, let's check your execution. Let's check your strategy. Let's build the capacity in your pelvic floor. Like we would build any other part of the body to manage a heavier load. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. Such sage advice. Perhaps you have it in you to create a continuing education program that can be built into eventually a full scope program. For fitness. Well, I have, we, I do have a certification. Um, and, uh, I actually have one coming up in San Diego in June and, um, it's it used to be called the core competence specialist certification. And it's now in the process of being renamed to just female core and pelvic floor fitness certification. Oh, wow. Come take it. <laughs> Dude. I'm so in on all of these things because I mean, yeah. it's, it's like every day in my office. Right. And, and so I feel kind of like I've, the boomers in my practice should be pissed at me for not knowing <laughs> all this information, but here we are. I'm trying to make up yeah, for it, guys. It's not your I'm fault. Trying. You didn't know. Yep. I'm trying. Oh my goodness. All right. Let's tell folks where to find you. Let's tell them about your, your 28 day challenge, you know, buff them off everything and, <laughs> and your podcast between two lips. Let's tell, I'll let you tell everybody everything and where to find you. Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed this chat and I, I really appreciate the opportunity to share. So thank you. Um, my website is vaginacoach.com. And if you go to any, if you go to Google and put vagina coach, you'll find me on some platform. And through there, you can find the link to my podcast, which is between two lips. Um, you can find my blog where I share all sorts of different articles. You can also share, uh, find the link to buff muff. So you can also go to buffmuff.com. Um, the, the people, basically come in and start with the, the buff muff method. It's 17 bucks. And in that they get a free gift of the 28 day challenge as well. So it, it, it's a very comprehensive program for 17 bucks and lays the foundation. It gives you everything you need. If people want more with coaching and more workouts and, you know, kind of progressing beyond there, they can come and join the membership if they like, but you can just do the one-time payment of 17 bucks and you get everything you need, including the challenge one time and, and you'll be off to the races. I love it. And, and so cost effective, my goodness. All right, guys, don't, don't, don't wait another day. Literally do not do that. Please, yeah. please take care of your pelvic health. It's going to be so much better. I mean, God, we have these commercials on TV that just, just make me want to cry the wick yeah. thing and yeah. the, it, yeah. the, no one wants that. No one wants no. that. So, and guys, it's not just part of being a woman. Amen to that. Amen to that. It is not normal, not part of being a woman. Guys, you got stuff you can do. And Kim, it's got you covered. Thanks again for coming on. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Hey, Health Junkies. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Health Fix podcast. To help support my mission, to bring you tips, tricks, and tools to help you optimize your health, I'd be grateful if you'd like, subscribe, and write me a review for the podcast. And if you hear a product you're interested in on the podcast, you can now go over to my website to learn more. That's doctor spelled out, J-K-R-A-U-S-E-N-D.com. Just click on shop and you'll find all the information on my favorite products that I stand behind and use myself. 
all affiliate income earned with your purchases goes directly to help support the production of the podcast so I can keep bringing you quality health information. I appreciate your support and I'm honored to have you listening to my podcast as a fellow health junkie. Thanks again. Hey, fellow health junkie. Thanks for listening to the Health Fix Podcast. If you enjoyed tuning in, please help support me to get the word out about the podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review, and just get that word out. Thanks again for listening.